Good morning. Welcome to the 22nd meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from our colleague Claudia Beamish today. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they may affect the broadcast system. Agenda item one today is on taking business in private. Uh, I ask members to agree to take items four, five and six in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. Agenda item two is to take evidence on the Water Industry Commission for Scotland. We're joined today by Alan Sutherland, the Chief Executive, and Donald McRae, the Interim Chair. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, members have a series of questions to ask you this morning, um, and we'll move straight to those questions, if that's OK. And to kick off, uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to kick off just with a quick question, actually a simple one, about how the Water Industry Commission has performed over um, the 2015-21 period. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the role that the Water Industry Commission has played in facilitating uh, how successfully it has performed in the last few years? Um, well, it, it, perhaps best to sort of try and split that into two areas. Um, in financial terms, um, we have been consistently ahead of budget um, and have returned money both to Scottish Water and to licensed providers. Um, so um, we have underspent our budgets, um, which um, uh, has been achieved whilst um, doing all of the jobs that we've got to do. Um, uh, so I think um, in terms of our sort of published deadlines and internal deadlines, I'm not aware of any that we haven't met. Um, we've continued to work with Scottish Government, with SEPA, DWQR and Scottish Water to make sure that the levels of service that um, customers are getting across Scotland um, is generally improving. That doesn't mean that everyone gets a perfect service all of the time. There's no doubt there'll be some examples, um, but the levels of service that are um, being provided are generally getting much better. So to give you one example, um, one of the areas that we've um, been um, encouraging Scottish Water to do much better on is the management of leakage. Um, and that um, has gone from being about 1.1 million litres a day um, of leakage to something just over um, 450 million litres per day, um, which is right down now at a, a sustainable level, so an economic level, taking into account environmental costs as well. By that point, however, and we will come on to leakage, that's measured leakage, isn't it, on the public supply? That's measured leakage on the public supply. That's correct, yes. Yes, yeah, so you don't know what's happening I don't mean this as a criticism, but you don't know what's happening on private supply, on agricultural land, for example. No, once, uh, you're quite, quite correct, convener. Once um, the, the responsibility is the customers, um, not always well understood, it has to be said, but once um, the water supply crosses the cartilage of your property, um, it is the responsibility of the property owner um, to um, maintain that 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 pipe structures and deal with any leaks that arise. But of course you can have the activities of the water supplier that can impact on that, can't you? But for example, if they suddenly turn the water pressure up on their pipe work, it can blow the pipes on a private supply. It, it, it certainly can. Um, and one would hope that in most cases that's something that Scotch Water would um, warn people who could be affected by. Okay, thank you. Emma Harper, do you have thank any you, yeah. questions? Um, as part of the three-year investment review, I'm sure you've alluded to leakage being one of the, the aspects that you'll be reviewing. Can you speak about other anticipated areas that your interim review will focus on? Well, the interim review essentially is, um, um, is, is, is not just um, um, our sort of unique activity, if you like, 
Um, it's something that the Scottish Government um, has a rather important say in, um, in terms of their priorities. Um, the customer views are going to be taken into account um, uh, through the input of, of citizens' advice. Um, and then you'll get the views of SEPA and DWQR as well, including, and then Scottish Water will have you know, their particular priorities that um, may be of a more operational or, or um, service level orientation. Um, so th so what do I expect to be in there? I, I, I suspect growth will be, um, um, will be, will be an important factor. Um, there's increasing evidence of um, um, uh, a need to respond to uh, increases in house building and, and shifts of population and um, uh, smaller households. Um, I suspect resilience of the system um, will be an increasing issue. Um, so there's, um, there's still a lot of systems in Scotland where um, quite large numbers of people are supplied by one source um, of water um, or um, one key um, part of one key pipe um, that were that to encounter a problem, um, then that community would end up being without water for potentially an extended period. So the, there's there's a there's a range of issues of that type. Plus, of course, there is the ongoing challenges of meeting um, environmental um, standards like the Water Framework Directive. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, David Stewart. Thank you, Kavir. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, looking at the area's performance and the measurement of the performance, I think it's fair to say. Um, that Scottish Water are an, an improving and improved organisation and I would certainly welcome uh, some of the positive indicators of performance uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, so I think that's important to put that on the record as the big picture issue. Uh, I want to, ha however, clarify a couple of detailed points. Obviously your job is to monitor uh, Scottish Water. What role do you have over the development of the actual targets that are laid down? Do you exclusively uh, develop the targets? Are they in conjunction with Scottish Water and Scottish Government? What is the role of the target development? Um, I think that probably happens at three levels. Um, so Scottish Government will set um, uh, a series of objectives for the industry at the start of each regulatory review period, which they could update. Um, and our job as a commission is to set prices that are consistent with Scottish Water meeting those objectives at the lowest reasonable overall cost. Um, some of those objectives, um, or, or all of those objectives, are tracked through a group called the Output Monitoring Group. Um, you'll find the minutes of their quarterly meetings um, on the Scottish Government website. That group comprises, it's shared by Scottish Government, involves SEPA, DWQR, ourselves, CAS, SPSO, Scottish Water, um, and it looks through all the capital projects and, um, and ensures that those that are not on track are, um, are being sort of identified and proactive actions are being taken to, uh, to deal with them. Um, so, that, so that's a sort of the first level. Um, the second level is um, uh, there are some um, long-term measures that we have used, such as the overall performance assessment, um, where the same factors, um, about 15 of them, um, are measured every year um, in the same way, and we can track progress. And you know, um, it's, it's measured on an indexed score basis. And to give you some sort of idea, when, when we first measured this for Scottish Water, the um, we're scoring about 130, 140 points out of, um, I think, a maximum of about 420. Um, as of now, they are regularly um, scoring around 400. Um, so that, that sort of shows you probably how far Scottish Water have come over, over that time. Um, in the last price review, um, we, as a commission, asked... Um, a, a customer forum um, to um, uh, work with Scottish Water and agree their business plan within uh, range parameters that were decided by the Commission. Um, as part of that work, they identified um, some new um, measures that 
um, uh, they consider it would be useful to be measuring. Um, so this is, these are things like um, uh, the, the reputation of Scottish water within its customer base and an aspiration to be um, genuinely leading service company, if you like. Um, um, Sorry, yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Sun, for um, that's obviously a lot of detail, but just to cut to, cut to the key point, um, one of the concerns I've had on this committee and, when, and previous committees when Scottish Water had a responsibility to the committee and other colleagues have raised this is the issue of water leakage. Uh, roughly, uh, Scottish Water were losing a third of all their water. Now, the current target, which they have had a double tick, as you know, is 500 million litres a day is lost. Now, for the committee, and I'm sure for the public, that's a figure it's difficult <coughs> to visualise. So before I came out, I looked that up, and that's equivalent to two Commonwealth pools a day being lost. Now, that's horrendous for climate change, and it's horrendous in terms of a target. So the point I'm trying to make is, I accept that there's two ticks in the box um, uh, in terms of there's an improving position. However, I think any ordinary observer would say the fact you're losing two Commonwealth pools per day uh, is not a great target. It's like saying, I only lost last week 11 nil, and this week I'm losing 10 nil. therefore I've improved. Well, yes, you have. The point I'm making is that target seems immensely high to me, um, or immensely easy to achieve. Is there not a role that you've got to say, surely we need to get this to a realistic target? Losing a third of all we produce doesn't seem to me to be a, a good indicator. I do accept the other indicators are very good, and I started my comments very positively, but would you accept the point, could you turn around and say, this target is ludicrously high, let's get real on water leakage? Um, actually, no, I couldn't. I, I just, I, I, I have to disagree with you, I'm afraid. No, um, uh, and the reason I say that is that we um, initially worked um, on the basis of what is it, what would it cost customers um, to reduce leakage, right? So for every litre of water that gets saved, there is a saving in the energy costs of treating that water, the chemical costs of, um, that are involved in that water, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and ultimately, over time, um, as you reduce leakage, then the size of um, the treatment works that would need to be there um, could be slightly downsized, and, and therefore there would be savings that come from that. If you look at that purely on that basis, um, then your, your level of leakage would, uh, that would be balancing and the customer would be entirely neutral on that calculation would be higher than the level of leakage currently is today, right? So the reason it's where it is today is we're starting to take account of things like the environmental cost of using water. Um, and that's not an exact science. Um, and people can have different views depending on how they value the environment, depending on the immunity value they ascribe to water. Um, and Doubtless that will change over time. We, we see signs that um, uh, communities and customers across Scotland are starting to value that more. Um, but you still have to put in quite a lot of cost on that to justify spending customers' money, which is what we're doing, to reduce it, to fix more pipes, um, which is what we need to do in order to reduce the leakage. So there's a combination of two things. So you're so so we're clear. You're you are comfortable as our government and as our Scottish Water on that target. I think the target is quite challenging. Right. Yes, because obviously there's a wider issue about climate change, which I'm sure other members of the committee will will take on board. Can I move on? Because I'm conscious of time, convener. Uh, the other issue I wanted to raise, where there wasn't such a good performance, was in the delivery of projects. And as you know, it was 28 was the target. 22 were delivered. And one couple of the reasons, and I know you're not fully responsible, Scottish Water have to answer for this, but you may well know the answer to this. Uh, two of the main reasons were planning constraints and construction comp constraints. Well, there wasn't really very much said about borrowing constraints. C could you confirm to me, was there any difficulty in delivering these projects in that sufficient borrowing, which I know is around 120 million a year is required? Was that borrowing uh, put on stream? Uh, if it was, why, why were these projects not delivered in time? Because uh, is that an issue in delivering these projects? I, I, um, I think it potentially could be an issue um, looking forward. 
Um, but at this point, if you, were, if you look at Scottish Water's cash balances, they are very substantial. Um, so um, given the amount of cash that Scottish Water is currently sitting on, um, it, it would not seem particularly prudent from a purely customer perspective to be paying interest um, on money that you don't actually need um, at this point. So yes, interest rates today are at historic lows, um, uh, completely accepted. Um, but um, likewise, the interest available on cash balances is, is sort of close to zero, um, as we all probably know. Um, and and um, so, no, I don't think that's a constraint. Yeah. The thing that I would add to the, the, the two factors that you um, mentioned um, is that um, at the, in the early stages of regulatory periods, there are often projects um, where we know that something needs doing, but we are probably not um, um, uh, completely certain how that problem is best solved, um, including the application of more innovative techniques or even non-engineering techniques of solving a problem. Um, so quite often in the early stages um, of a regulatory period, projects at the early stage of being transitioned from things that are sort of needs and twinkles in the eye of, of desired outcomes, formulating that into something that is a um, defined project with a budget, with a contractor in place, um, with the requisite planning permissions, um, can take a bit of time. Good. Um, I understand the point you're making. Could just pin you down on the previous point? Um, my understanding from uh, the previous committee looking at the business plan was that Scottish Water uh, would require 700 million borrowing over a six-year period to fulfil its objectives of completing its projects. It didn't fulfil its uh, projects. It was six short. Um, and that was roughly 120 million a year in borrowing. You won't necessarily have that figure in front of you today. Um, could you perhaps either confirm now or in writing, uh, is that, have I got this correct, what the business plan and what was the borrowing over the last six years? Presumably, if it's not, Scottish Water has not had its sufficient borrowing, it's not going to be able to complete its projects uh, on time. I, I, I certainly wasn't trying to be evasive, and I apologise if, if that's oh. how, you, how it came over, because that was not my intention. I was trying to be as helpful as I can. Um, the regulatory period runs from 2015 to 2021. Over that period, we believe that Scottish Water will need £720 million worth of borrowing. Right? Um, as the, at the start of this period, they entered into the period with a slightly higher amount of cash than we expected. They had some benefits from some um, uh, rent, uh, rates rebates in addition to the, the higher cash. Um, and they have um, continued to improve their overall efficiency. Right? So as of today, Scotch Water has plenty of cash. Right? To deliver the rest of the capital programme that it has to deliver between now, 2017, and, and um, the end of March 2021, right, the best estimate, as outlined in Scottish Water's delivery plan, is that they will need the full 720 million of borrowing that was promised by the Scottish Ministers. Right? The Scottish Ministers are on record as saying that that borrowing will be forthcoming. Um, I guess in, in, uh, you as members of Parliament will see that or be able to challenge that if you don't see it coming through um, in the usual budget round that, that, that becomes available. So the key point, and I'll finish on this, convener, is why did Scotch Water not deliver the 28 projects that it promised? I, th I think for the, 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 for the reasons that, that um, they've given you, the, the land availability and the planning permission, um, but also I would add this third one that um, I think there is an issue at the early, in the early stages of a regulatory period, and I think I've seen this now over three or four regulatory periods, so I can look back and see a similar pattern having happened, that I think we often end up including things for delivery which are not as well defined and certainly not well costed um, as um, uh, they will need to be in order to be delivered effectively. Now, if we're going to set prices for six years, which I think is desirable, um, we, want to be, uh, we want to be as clear as possible as to the benefits that can be delivered over that period. Um, but until we, until we can work out a better way of dealing with that front end um, uh, of the capital programme, then I, I suspect 
Um, if you were to ask me back in, in six years' time, we would probably see a similar sort of a pattern um, at the start of a regulatory period. Right. Okay, thank you. Can we, thank you. Can we just explore further the exact role you have? Um, let's take a major infrastructure project like the Shield Hall project, which my colleague Angus MacDonald and I visited. Very impressive project, but we're now told it's behind schedule. Um, or that is the allegation that's made there has been an impact, particularly in shopkeepers in parts of Glasgow who claim that their business has suffered. So could you give us a brief oversight on that project, whether it's on track or it's behind? If it's behind, what role, if any, do you have in monitoring, pushing that along? And do you have a role when businesses are saying that they have suffered as a consequence of Scottish Water's activities in encouraging Scottish Water to provide compensation, for example? Um, well, let's deal with the, 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 the timeliness of the tunnel. I'm not aware um, uh, of it being late at this point. Um, it is showing up in the reporting that, that um, is being provided to the Outputs Monitoring Group as being um, on schedule. So, um, you, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just not aware of, 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 of any such um, delay. Um, now, it would all tunnelling projects, so engineers tell me, are by far the most risky things that that um, uh, ever get tackled. So um, you know there has to be a chance um, that that um, uh, uh, there could be problems because um, there could be with any with any tunnels. Um, and, the, and the reason, is, as I understand it, that Glasgow only has one underground line is, is because of the ground conditions in Glasgow um, for tunnelling were particularly challenging. So the, the, there, are, the, you know, the, there are things that we'll need dealing with, but as of today, um, it, it, it appears to be um, on target. Um, with regard to impact on communities, that is not something that we would um, typically get involved in. Um, Scottish Water, um, um, I, I, um, I believe is quite responsive to um, well-evidenced um, uh, claims um, of, of um, impacts um, that, that they have had on, on communities. Um, but um, that, that will be something that you may well know more about than me because you may well have constituents that, um, that, that raise issues with you directly. So, to be clear, there is no oversight of how Scottish Water responds to complaints of that nature, then? Um, well, Scottish Water would... Uh, if, a com if, if a customer complained to Scottish Water and they felt that they had not had satisfaction from Scottish Water, that customer could and should um, refer their complaint to the Scottish Public Sector Ombudsman, um, who would then have um, the powers that, that um, they have to deal with resolution of, of, of issues arising. You have no role in that? We have no role in that. Okay. Uh, okay, let's move on. Um, Kate Forbes. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, non-household um, uh, customers and specifically around uh, the, the um, market in England because the Commission has consistently stated that a competitive retail market south of the border would benefit customers in Scotland through increased numbers of retailers and greater, greater competitive pressures. How do you see that happening in practice? How will the opening up of the non-household market in England affect the provision of water services in Scotland? Um, I fear not as positively as I may have hoped, um, and that is simply because the way in which um, the um, authorities in England um, decided to set prices and set market rules um, have made it more difficult for um, retailers to be um, as proactive in addressing customer needs um, as um, we would think um, appropriate. Um, so the, um, the positive dynamic um, that I think we saw in Scotland over the last, um, well, since the market was opened in 2008, um, was substantially about licensed providers um, actually trying to sell additional services to customers that would benefit those customers by 
um, potentially um, reducing their water usage or, or um, looking at some of the process engineering. Um, and the, there's, there's various um, um, sort of case studies from, from different license providers available. Um, that sort of activity in England looks now less likely to happen because the margins that are available for retail services um, seem to us to have been disproportionately allocated to the wholesale network side of the business as opposed to the retail side. Um, so I don't think there's going to be as much benefit. If there's uh, less benefit, will there be any um, adverse or cost implications? Um, there shouldn't be in Scotland. Um, we've tried to make sure that the market rules in Scotland have been updated and changed to make sure that Scottish customers, um, uh, both household and non-household, are fully protected. So one of the steps, for example, that the Commission took was to extend the extent of prepayment that a licensed provider has to make to Scottish Water. Um, so that if a licensed provider were to hit financial difficulty, um, simply because the margins in England um, are so much lower than we believe that they um, should have been, um, then if that licensed provider were to go out of business, there would be no impact on the Scottish water business because they will have prepaid um, uh, and there'd be time to resolve um, any issue arising from that. Um, so we, um, I think, are being very vigilant on that. We're being very vigilant on, uh, uh, on, on things like the, um, the sales practices um, that are being uh, adopted, some of the, um, the, the activities around blocking of switches. Um, so we're, 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 we're very, um, uh, being very attentive to potential um, bad behaviours. Um, and um, uh, you know, I think at the moment we see um, some increase um, in um, uh, some activities that we would consider to be um, not in the interest of customers. Scotland or England? In Scotland, <laughs> um, since the market opened in England in April. Um, but I, th I think um, at this point I'd say that I'm reasonably comfortable that um, we are taking the steps that we need to take in order to make sure that customers in Scotland will not um, uh, incur any detriment from that. Sorry. What what um, what evidence do you look to to um, be in sort of comfort that the non-household retail market in Scotland is working efficiently and effectively, England aside? Um, well, essentially, one of the what, what we would look at is to say um, a um, our, um, um, what, what's happening with um, customers and and. Um, uh, is there any sort of um, um, sense that customers are not um, thinking that they're getting value for money? Um, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that I'm aware of of that. Um, we um, are... What evidence would you look to to determine whether customers feel that they're getting value for money? Um, well, we would, we would look to... You know, do, are there complaints? Are there you know, articles and papers, that sort of thing, um, about, you know, issues arising. Um, and we don't really see um, much of that. Um, uh, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there sorry. for a second. Um, um, the, the market studies? Uh, yeah, the, 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 so we, we are looking at um, um, uh, the switch patterns. Um, and one of the things that when we designed this market, we were um, very determined was that uh, the smallest business um, um, could um, switch. People would want to supply that small business um, and that if they were wanted to switch, they were protected. And if they didn't want to switch, they were protected. Um, so so those, are, those are things that are pretty high up um, on, our, on our radar. So. Thank you. Yeah, can I just develop this point about customer satisfaction, if I may? Um, last year, I think it was, we had um, Business Stream's Chief Executive Joanna Dow in front of the committee, and I raised with her the issue of requiring customers to pay bills within 14 days. 
particularly agricultural customers. In response to that, a business stream indicated to the committee that they would introduce a system whereby it would be 21-day payment terms for customers who are not currently in contract with Business Stream, i.e. new customers. And in response to a letter that we sent to yourself, you said, in our view, a 21 days payment term for customers is in line with industry standard practice. So would you agree that it would be reasonable to introduce a 21 day payment uh, regime for all customers and not just new ones? Um, that sounds attractive. Um, but I'm not sure it's quite right. Um, and the reason I say that is that what there is in place today is um, um, if for that, for that customer who decides they don't want to do anything any differently to what they've always done, then the payment terms are 21 days after the receipt of an invoice. Right, so that exists. If a customer chooses to do something different and move to a different retailer, they may be able to get extended payment terms. They may, in some cases, some, some customers we're aware of have chosen to prepay um, um, retailers by quite substantial margins before they're even getting the service. They are doing that um, in order to win themselves bigger discounts. So I don't think it would be um, a sensible step for us to take to um, uh, take away the um, ability of a customer to choose to take a different price and a different set of payment terms if that's what they want to do. Now, you know, if uh, it, you know, it, it all depends on the sort of business you are, doesn't it? I completely accept that for um, uh, an agricultural producer or any sort of seasonal type of business, um, cash flow over, during a year can be a big issue and if the bill comes at the wrong time of year that, that, that's something that, that is potentially problematic but um, uh, that is, I'm, I'm not sure that going from 14 to 21 is going to particularly help a business that gets 80% or something of its, of its cash in in the last three months of a, of, of a calendar year um, because of the, the seasonality. Um, so I think the rather better is to sort of have um, a, a safety net contract, which is the 21 days, but then allow um, a, a, a customer to seek out a retailer who um, uh, can be um, properly supportive. So there are, for, there is, for example, one retailer I'm aware of um, has an affinity arrangement with the National Farmers Union. Um, so I, I would assume that be wrongly, um, but I would assume that that retailer, in working with the National Farmers Union to to have that partnership, um, has taken account of some of the pressures that um, exist for farmers. And who is that retailer? Incidentally? Castle Water. Okay, but you see the point I'm getting at because if, if memory serves, we were told by Scottish Water that they pay their bills in a 28-day cycle. It does seem a bit odd that they pay every you know on a 28-day basis, and yet they expect that customers to pay to a 14-day um, arrangement. Water or business stream? It was, it was Scottish Water. I think business stream indicated eventually they were the same. Right. Um, well, Scot Scottish Water's um, payment terms are something that um, are essentially a question for them to, to, to manage. We would look at their um, working capital balances and make sure that those were reasonable. Um, uh, clearly, um, if they are um, um, uh, in, uh, if they are running a bigger working capital balances, then that costs um, customers money. Um, so it's a question for them of balancing that. Um, um, again, if I go back to the point that Scotia Water have a lot of cash on their balance sheet, um, so it is it, for them. Um, getting cash in quickly or, or whatever is not necessarily um, the sort of thing that they um, would be as focused on as, as, a, as a business that was running um, a very healthy overdraft, let's say, or a very unhealthy overdraft. Um, as to business stream, I, I, um, I, don't, I don't really think it's appropriate for me to comment on that, simply because they are one of 20 odd retailers in the market. and. Yes, they have a, a big market share, but it's for each of those retailers to be able to justify to their customers um, 
their business practices and the offering they make to those customers. Okay, uh, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks. Um, Convener, can I just pick up on, on that last point? Would, would you be of the view that uh, um, Wix should perhaps have the power of, of oversight with regard to the way Scottish Water and Business Stream uh, conduct their, their business? For example, uh, the payment terms. Um, to be quite honest with you, n n no, no. If it's not impacting on the customer, um, I'm not sure really you want um, an economic regulator starting to um, interfere in the detailed management, financial management of of a company. That that sort of goes over the line between um, regulation into um, sort of management or control. Um, so I, I, I think if um, um, uh, you know, Scottish Water as, a, as an organisation um, that has its um, um, aspirations to be um, trusted by its customers to serve Scotland and, and you know, the good words that um, it, it tries to live by, um, it, it clearly there should be an onus on them to be able to justify their business practices and, and to be um, a good corporate citizen. From time to time, government um, expresses views um, on the payment terms that all public organisations ought to be adhering to. Um, so, yeah, I, I, as far as I'm aware, any any sort of examples of of Scottish Water not settling an invoice is because they believe the service not to have been provided. Okay, uh, so thanks for that response. Uh, if I could move on, convener, to the issue of uh, resources. Um, we know that you have a, a, a small team of, of staff of around 20 uh, based in Stirling uh, with an annual budget of 3.4 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also have a policy of growing talent internally. Um, are there any specific challenges in attracting and retaining staff with, with the necessary skills, given the expertise that's required? Yes, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I, I, I wish I could say to you, in fact, I was talking to Donald about this um, just, as, just before we came in. Um, we, we do have an issue in um, getting the right quality of, of staff. Um, we have consistently always emphasised quality over quantity. Um, uh, and um, that has, I think, over the last... Um, 17 or 18 years been the right thing for us to do. Um, but um, uh, I think um, um, it, is, um, it is getting more difficult to recruit. Um, uh, there was a period about um, three years ago, um, three to five years ago, when um, uh, the economy was maybe... Um, in, not, uh, in, in, in a less good place, um, where um, uh, probably some of the big professional services firms um, were re recruiting less, um, and there was maybe a, a, it was a little bit easier at that point. Um, but we've just been um, uh, trying to find some um, uh, experienced analysts, and we've um, uh, we've had a very very poor response to. Advertisements. Um, I do not think it's a matter of pay. Um, to be to be honest with you, um, it'd be very convenient to be able to go to to you or to government and say, "Oh, just pay the staff more, and it will be fine." I don't think it is that. I think there is um, a genuine um, uh, limit to the amount of um, um, analytical talent that that um, we're pro we're producing for whatever reason. Um, and um, I, I suspect that our location in Stirling is probably um, not necessarily the most attractive for people that see themselves as having an economic or financial career. Um, a few members around the table who would disagree with that. <laughs> or a couple uh, of these. Quite a lot of my staff would disagree with that as well. Um, but so yeah, there's there's um, so so there are yeah, it, it is not easy to retain. Um, our retention rate um, um, is is probably something of the order of 24 to 30 months for, for young people. 
on average at the moment, um, given it probably takes us about 12 to 15 months to get someone to the point of being really very productive. Um, we are often not getting much more than a year um, out, of, uh, out of someone before having to go around the cycle again. OK, so are you saying that the, the, the policy of uh, growing talent internally isn't entirely um, working? Well, I, 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 we're getting enough that we're doing our job. Um, are we getting as much choice as we might like? Um, uh, no. Um, are, are we getting, are we able to build a bit of resilience in um, such that if someone leaves, um, then, then um, uh, we, can, we can sort of almost sort of you know, yeah, um, continue as, as, as is. Um, uh, I'm just saying that I think there is um, not quite enough um, um, resilience in, in, in the system for my liking. OK, thanks. Um, we also know that Wix is funded by levies on Scottish water and by suppliers to the non-household market to secure the, uh, the 3.4 million that you, that you require. Yeah. Um, now, you may have partially answered this question in response to, to Katie Forbes, but um, do you believe Wix itself demonstrates value for money? Um, well, I think if you were to compare our budget per... Um, 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 connected customer of Scottish Water um, with the budget of um, economic regulators south of the border, um, then you would see that um, our cost per customer is either at or below that of our other regulators in, in England. And given that they are very much larger organisations um, with very many more customers that um, uh, get dealt with, um, then I, I think that um, and have benefit from real economies of scale and scope in the case of Ofgem, um, then I think we, we are pretty cost effective, yeah. Okay, thank you. John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener. And can I begin, please, by declaring an interest in as much as I own a water retailing company which is registered but not trading? Um, can I further... Um, in response to your response to Mr Stewart's question, I would like to congratulate you on the water leakage reduction targets. In, certainly in my constituency, um, you've made a huge difference, uh, or certainly Scottish Water Ham, um, and I'm, I'm very much welcome that, and I welcome the attitude of Scottish Water at all times when I have reported these leaks to them. Um, my question uh, particularly deals with um, we're seeking an update of progress on the 2021 to 2027 strategic review and for Wix to identify the key milestones ahead, including potentially the involvement of the committee. That will all, of course, um, have to have Brexit factored into it. And the, the key headings of capital maintenance, resilience, strategic capacity, private finance initiative, funded projects, partnership projects, supporting innovation. If you'd like to give us um, your insights into how you think that will emerge in, the, in that period, 21 to 27, please. Um, well, it's, um, in, the, in, in this regulatory period, there are um, there will be um, three of the OPFI contracts that were entered into in the late 1990s that will have run their course. Um, it is um, it is unclear at this point um, what the condition um, or, and um, operating capacity of, of some of the assets that come back to the public sector will be at the end of those contracts. Um, and um, you know, I guess this is one of these situations where um, we hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Um, so, so that is something that is a is an ongoing piece of work that Scottish Water is doing, and we are in um, close dialogue with them about what the potential implications of that are. Um, innovation, I think, is a really interesting one because, and this is probably something that's very relevant to you as a committee. Um, I think the evidence is that we are not going to build our way out of climate change. Um, 
we are going to have to find different and better ways of, of doing things and that may well involve um, uh, working with farmers to allow land to flood and finding appropriate compensation and reward schemes um, uh, to, to, to manage water better within catchments. Um, uh, we are um, uh, we are going to have to deal with um, uh, shifts of, of, of uh, in demographics. There is an increasing trend of population shift and new and property new build um, uh, to towards the east of Scotland, um, and that um, will put pressure on existing assets, um, probably um, by the end of the 2020s uh, in a serious way. Um, so, so that is going to have to be being thought about. Um, innovation, it seems to me, is going to be something that um, uh, is, is going to be very, very key to solving some of these problems. Um, Scottish Water has already begun, has made a, a fairly good start, I would say, in terms of trying to apply different techniques and, and um, different solutions to problems. I think they've got a lot further to go, and I think they would themselves say that they've got a lot further to go. Um, so one of the things that we were, as a commission, doing in our methodology was saying, um, is there anything in the way that we regulate Scottish water um, uh, that makes it more difficult for them to take an innovative decision um, or to do something more innovatively? To which the answer, I think, if we put our hands up, was probably yes. Um, and that is things like the way in which we would look at payback on projects, um, the way that we would look at projects purely within a, a, a regulatory control period, um, rather than saying, well, actually, this might pay back over 10 or 12 years. Um, uh, frankly, as a society, we have to get better, um, uh, particularly probably with um, public organizations like Scottish Water that if they try something um, and it doesn't quite work, um, not to be necessarily jumping down their throat just because they've tried something um, that is on the, um, on the on the frontiers of technology or, or process um, and it hasn't worked for, for a good reason. Um, because if we want if we want um, our water industry in Scotland to be truly world leading and, and innovative, then we have to accept that some of the things that get tried may not work. Um, and that's a bit of a culture shock for probably for all of us. Um, uh, uh, but we, we have to be able to identify this is a situation where we're going to try something um, and agree amongst the stakeholders, including Scottish Government, we're going to try this. We recognise this, um, this is pushing the boundaries of what might be possible. right? Um, but if we do agree that, we can't then come back and say to Scottish Water, oh, naughty boy, you got that all wrong. Um, so we've got, we've got to get that right. So that sort of um, scope and climate for innovation is something that I think is, is really important. Um, I think the, the other big theme of this price review is that what we want to see is Scottish Water um, really continuing to build the trust of its customer base and continue to make progress. And that means making, um, um, uh, you're dealing with all these sorts of things like payment terms or leakage reduction and responsiveness to customers and, and all of those sorts of things. Um, uh, but as an organisation, again, um, if, if we want um, Scottish Water to be um, uh, you know, a genuine sort of beacon of, of what Scotland can can achieve, then then we, we need um, to see progress in that sort of thing. So, for example, what is Scottish Water's involvement? Uh, they do do some of this. Scottish Water's involvement in, in schools, in communicating the value of engineering and STEM skills and, and that sort of thing. Um, is there more that they could do? Um, uh, there are real benefits in, as, as we probably all know, in terms of um, uh, educating um, uh, people when when they're um, uh, at school and 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 sort of communicating some of the some of the excitements of 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 an engineering career um, or indeed maybe even an economics career um, and and um, uh, uh, and building the reputation of the industry at the same time. So 
that sort of whole trust side is, is really important. Um, in terms of um, the assets of Scottish Water, um, I referred earlier to resilience. Um, there are still, I think, um, um, and I, I suspect Scottish Government and Scottish Water would agree, there are probably too many communities that um, have um, single sources um, for water. Um, and that is something that, that um, we need to um, be thinking about um, uh, and addressing um, to the extent that we can. Um, and then I think the, the, the last thing is, is something that is a much longer term challenge. Scottish Water has something like £60 billion pounds worth of assets in replacement cost. Um, it, it would be today investing around £300 million pounds a year in terms of the maintenance and replacement of those assets. The Scottish Water invests about £550 in, in sort of 2012-13 prices a year at the moment, but a large part of that's improving things. So the 300 is is simply on the maintenance and replacement. Um, if you look at, it's, if you're spending £300 million a year on maintenance and replacement on an asset base of £60 billion, right? The wonders of, of arithmetic tell you that you're assuming all of your assets on average are lasting 200 years. Right? Um, given that that covers everything from IT and vans on the one hand to the sewerage system on the other, that might be quite an ambitious number. Um, so looking at how much we're spending on maintenance and when we need the money um, it is, it is, is, a, is a really important aspect to this. And that's not because necessarily we need a lot more money now, um, but at some point, customers in the future, um, uh, you know, maybe even something that um, uh, you know, my children won't face even when they're my age, um, uh, so it might be a long way out, um, but customers in the future are going to face some quite sizable demands for the replacement of assets that um, fortunately our Victorian ancestors built with a degree of robustness which um, uh, we should be both proud of and grateful for. Um, thank you very much for that uh, extraordinary comprehensive answer and I must say I welcome it. Um, I mean, I think Scottish Water has done very well given the level of scepticism there was when it was first created, I must say. and. Um, and I think you've also played a, a, an important part in that. Um, can I just ask, and I'm not sure it's entirely appropriate, but I want to put in a plea at this point for the, for the work programme for the next period and with regard particularly to external sewerage, uh, external sewer flood, flooding, uh, particularly in my constituency in Prestwick, where this has been an ongoing problem for 40 years and Time after time, I am told that there is no money from Scottish Water because of government policy to um, make the lives of my constituents better, and they are certainly suffering at the moment because of a lack of an ability to address this. I dare say this is a problem elsewhere in Scotland, but could it be included in that programme? Um, and if Scottish Water uh, have plenty of money at the moment, then the sooner the better. Um. I'm not sure I said that Scottish Water had plenty of money at the moment. I think what I said was they had a large cash balance cash and a lot of things needs. still to do um, and that they would need government borrowing um, by the end of the period. Um, look, um, sewer flooding has to be, um, if it's not the most disgusting thing that can possibly happen to a customer, then it has to be right up there. Um, I'm not entirely sure what could possibly be worse. Um, uh, now, the hierarchy of this um, has been that um, we would seek to deal um, or have dealt with um, uh, any incident of sewer flooding that um, is internal to a property, because um, that's probably the worst of the worst. Um, and then the external um, flooding cases have been dealt with typically um, uh, in, with, with some degree of priority based on um, are they near schools or public buildings or um, uh, you know, are they sort of um, 
um, causing um, um, health or, or wider disruption. Um, now, it, it would be nice to believe that we could resolve all the aspects of external flooding. Um, I think my earlier answer about us not being able to build our way out of climate change um, has to apply here, unfortunately, in the sense that we are getting an increasingly unpredictable pattern of intense rainfall um, that is um, uh, causing um, the sewerage system a lot of pressure. Um, so there are a whole series of policy decisions that government is going to have to think about. Um, one is the prioritisation of external sewer flooding, and I think you can be assured that the customer voice is very strongly um, advocating that more is done about that. So um, that is there, but the, the, you know, there are um, um, uh, there are wider challenges with um, the management of surface water, um, highway drainage, um, who's paying what and why. Um, uh, so water customers, for example, pay for all the costs of highway drainage. Um, and that's, that puts quite a burden on the sewage system. Um, now, is that the right way of paying for it? That's a, that's a policy decision for government. It's way beyond the remit of the Commission or, or even Scottish Water. Um, but those sorts of impacts and the extent to which we manage surface water through the existing sewerage system or try and manage surface water through um, sustainable drainage systems and, and other methods of, of dealing with it, the more we can get surface water out of the sewerage system, um, the less likely it is that we will have these events of sewer flooding. Um, so, so that really is the challenge. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wide challenge. Scottish Water is doing increasing amounts of, of modelling of, uh, of, the, of water flows within catchments and now understands far more about how um, in the event of uh, you know, a deluge of rain at some point in, in their system, um, in the geography they're serving, how that would impact on their system and where potential overflow events occur. So, so the ex, the, we're, we're now in a much better place than we would have been, say, five or ten years ago even, in terms of modelling that. The technology's moved on very dramatically, um, and that, that's very positive. Um, but it, it, it still doesn't, you know, if you're the individual that is on the unfortunate end of, of a sewer flooding incident, it's horrible. Yeah, there's no other word for it. Right, very grateful for your answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to bring Mark Roscoe in, in a moment to do, explore the Brexit issue, uh, which John Scott touched on. Before we do, can I take you back to a comment you made earlier there about, I think it was along the lines of building trust and, yeah. and tackling the difficult issues. Yeah. One such issue, certainly from the perspective of the agricultural community, is the absence of a market code or licence requirement for proactive monitoring of metre reads or a requirement to notify customers in the event of high consumption being identified. Now, mm -hmm. business stream tell us that they, they have uh, measures in place that allow them to identify such incidents and that they will endeavour to contact uh, customers. But I think the reality out there is that in many cases that doesn't actually happen. Mm -hmm. What we end up with is um, farm businesses, and we know that farm businesses are in very difficult financial circumstances, generally sure. speaking, uh, running up huge losses um, relating to water loss, and um, and of course, you know, we also learn that, that there is the possibility of water shortages in parts of Scotland in decades to come. So it's a hugely important issue. Would you, in any way, recognise that perhaps there is a need for a market code or licence requirement to tackle this issue? Um, I, I, I think um, I think there may be a um, a better way of tackling it. Um, then, because the frequency of meter reads um, um, and the accuracy and the responsiveness of meter reads is, is never going to be more than once a month or whatever, right? So, um, if if a, if a leak starts happening on day two, it, it, um, best case best case, someone reads the meter says you know, that's ridiculous, it can't possibly be right, alerts the customer, it's still a month of, uh, you know, of, of, of a lot of water having, having sort of leaked out the system. So I, I think um, 
um, perhaps the, the best way forward for, for customers, particularly where that customer has um, um, extended pipe work, whether that be an industrial site or a farm, um, would be to fit a logger onto their meter. Um, this can be done really pretty cheaply these days, but what that will do you do is give you um, pretty much immediate information about the flow of water through that meter um, and can highlight very quickly if you have got an unusual um, usage pattern. Um, so, for example, um, you can see patterns of um, um, in industrial estates where um, uh, you can see the production process, you can see the amount of water that's being used, they're all in line, then suddenly you'll see that there's been some is issue with the pipework and there's a big spike in water usage. Now, people are very, uh, in the industrial world, very proactively using that sort of information, real-time information in many cases, to be able to do something about identifying leaks. So for a farm that, that um, you know, will know very well that it's, uh, it's involved in irrigation and, and it's, its water usage is going to be high for a period or um, uh, whatever, that farmer is going to know when he's using water. The information that would be available from a logger would tell him he's suddenly using water when he doesn't expect to be using water, therefore he's got a potential problem. And at least he's got a sporting chance at that point of trying to do something about it. But to be clear, he would be, he or she would bear the cost of installing the logger, and he or she would bear the responsibility of checking the information as well, opposed to the to the supplier. Not necessarily, because some licensed providers um, have been fitting loggers as part of their service package, okay. um, and some licensed providers are monitoring the results of these loggers on behalf of their customers. Um, so, you know, yes, you could do it yourself. Um, and you, you know, but the capital cost of fitting a locker is now not big. Um, uh, but you, you could potentially not even face that capital cost by um, uh, agreeing to a, a service contract with, with a licensed provider. So you're, you're highlighting there some good practice examples. How would we ensure that that was rolled out across the sector without having some sort of regulatory uh, interference here? Um, well, it's certainly something that um, I'm very happy to, to take back and, and think about more okay. as to whether um, it, it should be standard practice to fit a logger okay. in, in, in all circumstances. There are some meters that Scottish Water has where fitting a logger can be um, problematic, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's much less of an issue now than it, than it might have been three or four years ago. Okay. Um, but you know, again, this is one of these things where technology is moving on pretty rapidly, and the opportunities here are are, are very real for customers. Okay, well, I, I very much welcome that undertaking. Could I invite you to write back to the committee once you've had time to reflect upon that approach? Sure. That would be yeah. very useful. Thank Happy you for to. that. Uh, Richard Lyle. Thank you, Convener. Can I ask uh, one uh, question from your last uh, comment you made about highway drainage? It's always been my contention that not enough is done to gully empty some of our drains, and if actually if you look at some drains along a road and any highway, most of them are silted, uh, are covered over. Um, does that, is that any responsibility of yours and discussions with Scottish Water and local authorities? I, th I think, unfortunately, what you, um, what you might be seeing is what happens when someone um, is the benefit of a service, i.e. the drainage, but isn't actually paying for it. Um, so the, the people managing the highways um, uh, are not paying for the service they're being provided, so they might be not quite so um, um, keen as they might be if they were paying to um, clean out those gullies and, and, and keep costs down so for others. So it's not a responsibility of yours, it was just no. a question I wanted to no. ask. Okay, thanks for that. Um, right, the Water Industry Commission um, introduced the Customer Forum of, as part of its strategic review of charges for 2015-2021. Um, you had reports, uh, I'd like to see the report from them, uh, from the last committee. Uh, Professor Stephen Littlejohn done a, a report. Um, you have now appointed Peter Peacock as the chair of the Customer Forum. Uh, can I ask you about the progress in establishing the Customer Forum and how the forum is made up uh, and what status and influence of the forum 
has an influence in the 2021-27 strategy? Um, well, the, the Customer Forum is now fully up and running. Um, so all the members are in place. They've had um, a series of initial meetings with both the Commission and Scottish Water and SEPA and DWQR. Um, uh, so, that, so the process is underway. Um, their remit is essentially one that um, um, uh, is, is defined by a, um, a tripartite agreement between ourselves, Scottish Water and um, uh, Citizens Advice. Um, their aim is um, to agree Scottish Water's business plan um, and the Commission will publish um, against all the key inputs to that business plan what it perceives to be an acceptable range for those numbers. So the idea in effect is to allow um, a, a, a group of customers um, acting as a conduit for wider community and customer views across the country um, to finalise with Scottish Water um, priorities. Um, and that's within the framework of ministerial objectives and principles of charging and below the ministerial objectives and framework uh, and principles of charging, um, the views of the Commission in terms of you know, efficiency challenges and that sort of thing. Um, it says, and Mr Peacock said, we will bring the customer's voice to the table. Are there customers on this forum or is it mainly made up of appointees? Well, I guess we're all customers. Um, yeah, but I'm meaning ordinary customers, someone, you know, Mr and Mrs Joe Public. Right. Well, the process, the, 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 the forum um, has 12 members. Um, Who are? Um, well, I'll talk you through it. Um, so um, the three partners um, appointed Peter Peacock as the, as the chairman, um, and that was done by um, agreement. Um, the, there are then um, three um, licensed providers um, who um, have representatives on um, the forum. They were chosen by their fellow licensed providers. So there was a process by which all licensed providers were invited to nominate themselves or others um, to sit on the forum. Um, there was then a process by which that was narrowed down to the three that um, um, are there. Um, and then um, Citizens Advice ran a process, an open um, advertised process for people who were interested in as, as household customers on sitting on the, um, uh, on, on the forum. Um, and that led to the appointment of the remainder. That's what I want to hear. Um, can you tell me whether the forum is adequately resourced? You indicated uh, in your comments that it will, let, it will get an increased budget. Can I ask what the budget is? And can I ask uh, how it's compared to the last forum, i.e. how much an increase and also, you said that you would extend the remit of the 2021-27 forum. So how do you intend to extend the remit? So it's, what's the increase in budget? What, what, how does it compare to the last time? And what's the extent of the remit? So the budget is um, just over 800,000 for the next three, over the next three years. Um, that's about double what they spent last time around. Um, I don't know whether they'll spend that whole budget or not, but that's the money that um, we've provided for. Um, we've provided for that in the knowledge that um, there is more that we can potentially do in terms of understanding what's important to customers. Um, so this is, um, <coughs> to give you some flavour for that, trying to go beyond standard research um, techniques and look at um, some of the developments in behavioural economics and behavioural insights to look at how is it that customers really react. So as an economist, you'll get taught that we're all terribly rational and do things and, you know, somehow we do things exactly right all the time, what's in, exactly in our interests. Um, of course, um, I don't know about you, but I don't think I do. I wish I did sometimes. Um, so by using behavioural insights, you can sort of unpick that and try and understand um, what is it that we could do to actually encourage customers to do 
things that, that we want them to do or, or, or that we want to understand what they want us to do. Uh, so that's one of the reasons for the increased budget, um, uh, but also one of the reasons for, for you know, maybe a little bit less certainty about what that budget um, needs to be. And on the subject about the budget, you made a comment at the very start, the under, you underspent, or you know, not you individually, but uh, the organisation underspent the budget. How much did you under, underspend it by, and uh, are you giving some of that back to Scottish Water or to your, uh, the other people who you get your uh, funding yeah, the from? Last, the last three years we've given back, um, I think the least we've given back in the last three years is about £100,000 in, in one year. Well, can I, under, can I compliment you on under, underspending your budget? I wish others would do that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let Mark Ross go in briefly on this subject, and apologies to Mr Ruskell, because I didn't let him in on the Brexit subject. So when you finish this, perhaps you can move on to Brexit. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be quite a, a jump, I think. But um, I wanted to ask about whether you feel that the customer forum really adequately addresses the whole public interest. Um, can I give you two examples? Uh, I've been getting quite a lot of correspondence recently in my email inbox from communities that are concerned about Scottish Water's assets and about the spread of giant hogweed, non-native invasive species. You'll probably see some around the corner from your office if you go to the waterworks there. Um, a lot of community concern, obviously it's a public health issue. Uh, the other issue I've been getting a lot of correspondence about is um, in relation to um, microfibers within the marine environment and about the lack of investment in the water industry in, in screening these out. Now, those are two issues that are, are fairly new to me clearly as a public concern. How would those kind of issues work in relation to this? Is it, is it the role of SEPA to sort out whether those are significant enough issues for Scottish Water to invest, or is it the customer forum? Or where, where, do, where would those issues sit within the current framework that, that we've got? Um, well, they, they, they could sit in probably one of three places. Um, uh, and ultimately, um, uh, it would be one of these things where um, we would expect us guidance to get to get guidance from Scottish Government and in terms of relative priorities. Um, so three places they could sit is um, uh, one um, within the framework of environmental legislation, um, principally European, um, uh, and there are increasing moves, as, as no doubt the committee is aware of, uh, of Europe cons um, consistently. Um, tightening and, 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 and setting challenges, um, probably pretty welcome challenges for all of us, um, societally to, to, to sort of make, make progress. Um, secondly, there will be an assessment that is made for, from SEPA about what they think um, within that legislative framework and within government priorities they should be focusing on. Um, uh, and then third, there will be a customer view um, on, on several of these issues. And, and one of the things that I think, um, um, I think I probably alluded to this earlier, we are seeing, I think, um, a much more proactive view coming from communities across Scotland um, about the quality of the environment that they're experiencing. Um, and that, that, I suspect, is only going to um, continue to increase. Is that feeding into this customer focus it group? Would, would you get issues um, well, like one, well, the well, asset it's, we're, at, we're at an early stage, but one of the things that we very specifically have asked um, the customer forum to, to do this time is to reach out to different communities, both in a geographic sense, but also in a, a, sort, of, um, a, a sort of common interest sense of community, mm -hmm. um, I, I, in order to sort of bring that information back into... Um, into the discussion arena. Um, so it, it, some of these issues, um, you know, clearly there's been um, the Sky campaign on, on some of the, um, the plastics in, in, in rivers and oceans and, and whatever. Um, so there is, I think, an increasing awareness um, that is beginning to, to, mm -hmm. to, get, to rise, and I'm, I'm sure that's going to go up the agenda. Okay. Um, so you touched on European environmental regulations, and that, that brings me to Brexit. I mean, as far as I see it, there, there are two main areas to consider. One is what, what the future may be of those environmental regulations and how you see that impacting on the future investment programme. Um, the second question is, is around 
market liberalisation and the potential trade deals that may come post-Brexit. Now, we asked the question in this committee about the impact of the CETA trade deal with Canada and the EU, yeah. um, and we had the response back that Scottish Water hadn't considered the impact. Um, well, I think they'd considered the impact on their services they deliver in Canada, but they hadn't consider, considered the potential impact on their status, mm -hmm. um, which conceivably might be might be challenged as a, as a state operator going forward under future trade deals. So on those two issues, environmental regulations, standards and trade deals, what, what do you see in your crystal ball for the, for the water industry in Scotland? Well, the, the Scottish Government um, um, has said um, that it intends to, um, whatever happens with regard to Brexit, that um, it will respect EU directives and will seek to um, at least match standards that um, are, are um, being required in Europe. Um, I have to say that we are um, um, we are quite good at this relative to a lot of countries in Europe. Um, uh, we we are not perfect. Um, we have got further to go, but we have made um, a lot more progress than than many parts of of Europe. Um, and we're probably much more straightforward in our reporting than many parts of Europe. Um, so um, you, you, this, the, the, uh, I think that's something that we can be proud of. That doesn't mean that we've got to where we need to get to, because um, I don't think we have. Um, in terms of expenditure, um, when I was first appointed, I, I, um, I got a, a document um, on the 1st of November 1999 um, from Sarah Boyack. Um, who was the Transport and Environment Minister at the time. Um, and the document was called Quality and Standards 1. And it said that in seven or eight years, we will have met all the environmental standards that we think we're going to have to met, meet. Um, and this sort of bubble of investment will go away. Um, so we're now 17 years later. And looking forward, um, we are going to probably be continuing to spend of the order of 200 to 250 million in today's money of, of uh, investment in improving our environment um, uh, for at least the next 14 to 15 years. Okay. So, right? so there is an ongoing commitment here to substantially improving the quality of our water and the quality of our environment. So you don't see a change in that. So if we look, for example, at the, um, the EU standard to uh, restore all water bodies to good ecological condition by 2027, I mean, yep. that, that takes us into the post-Brexit period. Yeah. But that's in the programme. That's going to continue. That, no change. At this point, all the planning that is being done in the industry is that at least those standards are going to have to be met and maybe more uh, advanced standards beyond that. Okay. So, and in terms um, of trade deals and trade deals, I'm afraid you're talking. To, you are talking to the wrong person. I, I might be an economist, yeah, but I'm, I'm afraid <laughs> um, I, I gave up international trade when I left university. <laughs> okay, not so, one, so not who's looking at this issue then? Because I think that the response to say we got back from Scottish Water is there's been there's been no assessment of the impact of, on CETA of, of of Scottish Water's um, public status in Scotland. Do we just assume everything's fine then, or? Well, I I. Um, I, I I'm a regulator. I'm never going to ever assume anything is fine because it's um, uh, something that is completely anathema to um, to my way of doing things. So, if if I were in government's shoes, I'm sure I would be carefully assessing what the impact on um, public bodies um, in in the in Scotland and the the wider UK is. Um, because we are, in that sense, very different to North America, where they may well have lots of not-for-profit and, and, and uh, type structures, but they do not have public trading corporations in the same way that we are. Mm -hmm. We have. So, um, yeah, there are, there are issues there. Draw to the Cabinet Secretary's attention by writing well, to Well, it, it would be... I, I'm sure they are thinking about it, and they don't need me to tell them to think about it, but... Um, there, there will be issues probably for this parliament and, and um, uh, the, the Westminster um, uh, parliament as well. Okay. But if there was a trade deal on the table which opened up the market, say, in household water supply, 
what would be your role in terms of informing any debate on that? Would you be commenting on that? Would you be pointing out the pros and the cons well, I, we, we, I, in economic I, I think terms? What, 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 or would you just go, not well, for us? Um, I, I think we would always comment on what, um, the, where the customer interests lay. Um, as you'll probably be aware, um, the Westminster government floated um, household competition for water services in England. Um, I have to say, I think um, this is purely a personal view, um, uh, but I think it would be a downright silly idea. Um, and the reason for that is that um, the difference in costs between um, um, uh, customers who live in different parts of the country is very, very significant. Um, the costs of serving, even if you look at just the cost of issuing a bill and responding to a customer's needs, um, the costs of doing that in, let's say, the Western Isles are um, a multitude of, of what they are um, if you're um, uh, nearer, in, in, let's say, in the central belt. Um, so if, if you, um, unless you arrange your market in such a way that um, those sort of social uh, protections, the universal service obligation is properly protected, um, you would unleash a series of forces that I suspect most people um, would consider highly undesirable. Um, so I, I, I really don't think household um, competition is, is a very sensible um, thing to do, um, but that's, that's for others to, to do. Uh, now, if, if there is a requirement to do it, um, uh, then I'm sure that it would be possible to work out a series of arrangements um, that could substantially mitigate, if not eliminate, some of the potential um, uh, societally detrimental impacts. Now, that's not to say that competition couldn't bring benefits, because competition historically has brought benefits of innovation and reformed process and reduced costs, but whether those benefits would actually um, more than offset the the issues that, that I'm talking about is, um, is is a judgment that ultimately you in this parliament would, I, I guess, have to make the trade-off on. Chairman, um, could I just note that... Those were remarks on, made on a personal basis. Yes. There's not the views of the Commission. The Commission will, will, not, will not have a view on that issue. I think he made clear there was personal views. Thank you for that. Uh, Finlay Carson and then Donald Cameron. Thanks, Kavina. My apologies. I'm going to jump, jump back somewhat, back to the customer forum. Um, could, you, could you tell me what remit or influence the customer forum would have on the likes of uh, water charging for community organisations? I know certainly over the last 18 months, I've had a lot of correspondence from constituents who are concerned at the level of water charges. Um, and there seems to be a push for, for community organisations to become charities to somewhat mitigate those charges. What, what influence or remit would the forum have in regards to that? And potentially also to look at, a, again, in my constituency, ex-Forestry Commission houses that weren't on the, uh, the mains water um, and the issues they have now getting a, a decent water supply. Where would the customer forum come in to ensure that those types of communities come under the remit of Scottish water? Right. Um, two quite different issues, I think. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of sort of the charitable relief scheme, um, that is a matter um, purely for government. Um, the rules of the scheme are set by government um, uh, and um, uh, have been refined over time to try and sort of target those that um, are believed to need the most support. Um, uh, others will judge how effective that is, but um, I guess whenever there is any um, uh, form of benefit being handed out to some and not all, um, there will be people on the margins that are either very pleased that they get it or very unpleased that they don't get it. Um, so I, I think that's, that's one for government, and you know, um, I guess your questions are probably best directed at them. Um, I don't think we or Scottish Water or the Forum, um, well, we might all have individual views, um, but we, it's, it's not something that, that we would um, get involved in. 
Um, your second issue is, is um, uh, probably a growing issue, um, which is um, the connection of um, uh, the, the two, two and a half percent of households in Scotland that are not connected to mains water. Um, now, in many of those cases, people are quite happy with that um, and they've got a reliable source um, and it's of a standard that they're quite happy with. Um, uh, you know, theoretically, those um, are required to meet um, uh, the same water quality standards as the public network. Um, that's something, though, that is policed initially by local authorities and then with, with the drinking water quality regulator having ultimate oversight of what local authorities are doing. Um, uh, I think there are there is some evidence, I think, um, growing that um, uh, there are some issues with sufficiency for some on private supplies and some issues with quality um, on private supplies. Um, and, but the costs of connecting those properties is often very, very uh, significant. Um, so the question is, who should pay the bill? Um, how much of it should be paid by the household or how much by other customers, potentially how much by taxpayers? Um, and that, that's a decision that, that, that ultimately needs to be being taken. Um, but it's, it's probably a growing issue, would be my, my sense. Something that, uh, that a customer forum could could raise and make recommendations or I, I, there's no reason why well one of the one of the advantages of that of this particular system is that um, uh, as issues like that manifest themselves particularly it's the rural communities really that that this is impacting that 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 information comes back as to how people actually feel about that um, you know of course what we have to be careful is that if we put infrastructure in that someone actually wants it um, so there have been examples of um, uh, sewerage on the on the waste side being made available and people saying well I'm actually quite happy happy with my septic tank I don't want to pay a sewerage charge um, and therefore not connecting to the sewerage charge now that undoes um, the potential environmental benefit that, that was going to have been brought about by a higher quality of treatment of waste so we have to make sure people actually want the new connections that they're being given. Two, two short questions. Um, given your answer to one of Mark Ruskell's questions when you spoke about the disparity uh, in terms of customers um, across Scotland, g going back to the forum, how do you ensure that um, the customer forum is truly representative of the whole country? We don't. It's, it's not meant to be representative. This is going to, um, you may consider I'm playing with words, but I'm not, I'm genuinely not trying to. Um, what I would say is that the forum is trying to represent the views that it is hearing in the community. It is, it is not representative in itself of the community. So it's acting, the words I prefer to use rather than use the word representative or represent is, is to act as a conduit. So just act as a, as a mechanism for getting those very different views that exist in communities across Scotland back in um, and make sure that, that all those different views can be heard um, and that there's an awareness of them. So it's not trying to be representative. It's not like you guys in the parliament. You are representative of the population. But what, what if, for, I mean, speaking very generally, what if rural Scotland has a point of view about being, being a customer that is very different from urban Scotland? How, do you, how does it work? Well, that view should be, should be coming back and, and should be being reflected. In that, and that view will be very different, right? Um, so, you know, if, if I were to ask you know, um, about rural connections um, in Argyllshire or Aberdeenshire, which are the two big areas where um, we have real issue with, with, with that um, or, or particular issue with that, then that's pretty high up the list because in Argyllshire, you'll probably find some areas, um, you know, 20 or 25% of the population are not connected to means water. Right. Um, so for the, for some people in those areas, that will be a really big issue. Now, if I ask that same question in in Glasgow, 
I'm not going to get the same answer. So you are going to get very different views. But what we what we got to do is is make as good an effort as we possibly can of capturing all those different views and understanding what people actually want us to do about it. And if we make the service available, would they connect? Um, because there's no point in us making spending a lot of money to make it possible and then then not want it. Okay. Um, moving on to Brexit. Um, Mark Ruskell asked you about legislation. If you took, as an example, water quality, would, would it be your view that there is nothing to stop the Scottish Government from introducing legislation here that adhered to EU rules on, on water quality in a scenario post-Brexit? Well, they already do, because the standards in Europe are typically brought into force in the UK through domestic legislation. And my point being that after Brexit, you foresee nothing to change that. Um, well, the the, the process um, would be different in the sense you wouldn't be responding to, or you wouldn't necessarily be responding to a European standard. You may choose to respond to a European standard. That's, um, I suppose, for this Parliament to decide what it wants to do. Um, the question, I suppose, is um, are we going to ensure, as a society, and this is something that um, members will have different views on or may have different views on are we going to are we going to continue to want to set ourselves up as an exemplar of environmental performance or are we going to be prepared to let um, our standards slip um, I suppose with um, with EU and its enforcement um, processes there there is a real cost to letting performance slip now, that might be something that people consider desirable, or it might not. That's a, that's a, that's a political question, I think. So many unknowns here. Um, just to wrap this up on the issue of uh, climate change, which we caught to some extent, but I think Mark Russell's got a couple of questions on that. Um, I think we've covered some aspects already. Um, I mean, you mentioned that we can't build our way out of climate change, um, but you also talked about the need to create a climate of innovation uh, within the water industry and some of the challenges there around payback. Yeah. Um, and then creating the right framework to allow that innovation, allow that risk taking. I don't know if you've got any, anything more to add on, on that. Is there particular well, I mean, projects I, or examples no, I, you can, I think that you I, can I, raise? Well, uh, one of the, one of the um, projects that I um, um, only actually learned about yesterday, um, which I, I thought was um, a fascinating example, but for whatever reason, the lights being being held firmly under the bushel, which was um, that parts of the wastewater stream were being used in Gala Shields to generate heat for the, and, and were heating the local community college. Um, now, you, you, when you look at wastewater treatment, there is a, a marked difference in the temperature of that usually versus the ambient water where the discharge um, goes. Um, and some countries, for example, Switzerland are um, uh, are doing great work in terms of recovering nutrients and recovering heat from wastewater treatment. Um, now, here's an example of Scottish Water actually beginning to do it. Um, I don't know whether any of you knew about this, but I didn't. Um, it's a really good example of how potentially you could deal with some of the um, inevitable community issues. You know, no one particularly wants a wastewater treatment work set right next to them. Um, but if you were to potentially combine in the future a wastewater treatment works with a community heating scheme um, for a local community, then you know, the, the, the incentive of, of free heating for um, the, the residents most impacted by the, um, the potential blight of the sewage works might um, change their view as to um, the location of the sewage works. So mm -hmm. I, I think there are, there are a lot of things that can be done that are economically justifiable um, environmentally uh, in potentially very valuable to do and the, the, um, uh, uh, and the, you know, from, a, from a social point of view would be potentially doing the right thing so um, the, there's, there's an awful lot needs to be, to be being thought about in this space um, it, 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 we're started but there's, there's more to do yeah. That's an interesting example because, again, I think that's being planned in Stirling as well, not far from your offices, yeah. so you may end up being heated by wastewater at some point. <laughs> but with that as a, as a particular project, though, is there not a challenge about how that slots into the investment programme? Because you spoke earlier on about 
a range of projects coming forward early on in investment programme and then being seen to be perhaps technically unviable or, or changed and therefore that affecting the deliverability of the whole, whole programme. How do you kind of de-risk that, that element around these innovative programmes that are, that are being brought forward? They may, may just be ideas, they may not be technically viable. Well, one of the things that we're in discussions with Scottish Water and Scottish Government at the moment is separating out um, those aspects of the capital programme where it's absolutely defined, it's costed, we know what we're doing and, and the monitoring of that and separating that from the development of ideas and needs and potential solutions. Um, so in many of these cases, potentially, a more complex scheme that involves heat recapture or, or um, uh, some energy generation at source or whatever, um, could be the, cor the, the correct economic answer, not just the environmentally right answer, it could actually be the economic answer without the environmental benefit. Um, without sort of costing the carbon or or, um, or, or that sort of thing. Um, now, once you get into this, you know, one of the things that I and Douglas Milliken have had a number of conversations about is how is it that Scottish Water is going to, um, in the future, evidence that it is um, playing a, 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 a real role in, in, in meeting carbon targets. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, work in this area. It's it's still early, um, but I, I I think by um, hopefully freeing up or declogging the the beginnings of the capital program, so that there's more space to think about how the needs of a community, not just the wastewater treatment needs, but other needs as well, might be being serviced by um, an intervention. Mm -hmm. um, that that can only be to the general good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And the final word from John Scott. Um, thank you very much, uh, Convener. And can I just say how very much I support what your comments about supporting the innovation within Scottish Water. I think it's Scottish Water Horizons who have done very good and innovative work in the past, and I'm a great fan of what they do. Um, I would just uh, you spoke about um, not building our way out of. Um, climate change, and I agree with that again utterly. And I think more, I have to declare an interest here as a farmer, but also as a member of the build, the, the, the team, the, the committee that created, um, about dealing with catchments um, and, and incentivising farmers. I think that's vitally important that we stay ahead of the game, that they are incentivised perhaps um, in part of the rural payment schemes, um, the, the new rural payment schemes that we will need to create. It's a way of of doing that, but taking the peaks off floods and allowing um, what were natural floodplains to flood more freely. And I, I think, I mean, I think the legislation exists to do that, but I don't think much has been done in that area. And I utterly agree that climate change is going to become more and more of an issue and that we should stay ahead of that curve, so to speak, and that's one way of doing it. Get these hydrological surveys done that would tell us at what levels um, we need to allow inundation of, of, of floodplains um, to, to take peaks of flood, to floods to protect places such as Perth, for example. Well, one of the um, one of the issues, obviously, with um, good ecological status required under the Water Framework Directive, is the extent to which, over the last hundred plus years, we have modified the course of rivers you know, for industrial or, or uh, um, other purposes, um, and that has impacted on um, you know, the um, the quality of the water and. and um, uh, and all of that. So there is going to have to be a, uh, there is going to have to be attention paid if we're going to be as good as we aspire to be. The issues that you mentioned are absolutely right, and a large part of this, I suspect, is working out a way in which um, you know, um, it might be better um, to be paying a, a farmer not to um, uh, grow a particular crop, but to make that land available for for flooding um, uh, uh, or, or flooding mitigation in some way. So th there's, there's, there's lots of discussions to be had and there's an opportunity, um, I guess, with um, uh, you know, over the next few years to, to be having those sorts of discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, thank you for your time this morning. I think that's been most useful. Um,
Mr Sullivan just said you would come back to us once you reflected on the, the logger issue. We look forward to that in due course. As I say, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we now move on to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. Uh, this concerns the Loch Caron Urgent Marine Conservation Number no. 2 Order 2017 SSI 2017-205. I refer members to the paper and invite any comments. Angus MacDonald. Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, clearly, I had uh, initial concerns regarding the description of the boundaries in the original instrument. Um, however, I'm satisfied, given the Cabinet Secretary's response, that there's no ambiguity from the, the perspective of the, of the local fishing industry. Um, and with regard to this replacement order, I've, I have no issues. However, I think it would be good if this committee was given sight of the BRIA once it's been completed, um, which may not be imminent, but uh, it would still be good to, to see uh, at some point in the future, uh, just with regard to the impact that, uh, that it's having. Okay. Any other comments? I'm very happy to agree with it. Okay. <coughs> Uh, taking Mr Macdonald's point on board, perhaps we could write to the government and seek that information. Uh, with that in mind, um, is the committee agreed it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? We are agreed. Okay. Um, at the next meeting of the committee on the 19th of September, we will take evidence on the Scottish Parliament's environmental performance from the Chief Executive, Sir Paul Grice. We now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed. <laughs>